right. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we're going to go through Chapter 10 tonight. We're going to be talking about interest in real estate. Uh, we are going to have this in two parts. So we're going to break this down. There, we're not going to be able to do 100 slides uh, in one day. So uh, we're going to get from the beginning to water rights. And then on Monday, we'll pick up uh, and finish it up and go from there. So uh, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to go ahead and get started. Our learning objectives uh, for tonight is going to be to identify uh, the limitations on ownership rights uh, that are imposed by governor action or government action. We're also going to describe the various estates and land and the rights and limitations they convey. We will also list the nine lien rights that are foreclosable against Texas Homestead. We will then further <clears throat> explain the concepts related to encumbrances, including creation of easements, terminations of easements, and distinguish among the surface and groundwater rights in Texas. Lastly, we will distinguish between the specific and general liens, the voluntary and involuntary liens, as well as statutory and equitable liens, and we'll also try to give you examples of each of those types of liens. We'll then further describe the key components in each of the four phases of the annual tax levy process and the steps for levying special assessments. Next, we will identify the process through which real estate taxes uh, become delinquent or become a lien, the enforcement options and the equitable and statutory rights of redemption. And lastly, we will explain the various types of liens other than the taxes and how they are going to be prioritized to satisfy unpaid debts. So as you can tell, a lot of material, but a lot of material that we're not going to be able to cover all tonight. Okay, it's going to be a lot to go through and I would rather space this out and go into detail than try to rush it. Okay, so with that being said, if you have taken any of the previous courses, you probably have heard about government powers. Okay, and we've talked about this before. We're just going to reiterate this, but if you've not heard about this, this is completely brand new. Uh, to you, and it's going to be again discussed in other classes if you've not heard of it. Okay, but uh, the government powers are broken down. Of course, the first two that you're seeing here on the slide is going to be taxation and police powers. Now, the very first one, taxation, that one everybody loves taxation, right, Stephen? Everybody, y'all love paying taxes, right? Everybody, right. Miss Lila, you you love paying taxes, right? It's it's just such a fun thing to do, correct? Of yes, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. I recommend it. You recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> so by all means, you know, we go through this, you know, taxes are just that the only time we actually probably get ecstatic about tax season is if we're getting a refund. Okay. But uh, most of the time, it doesn't happen. And unfortunately, that's just income tax. With property tax, you never do get a refund. Okay. Uh, you pay it and that's it. So the problem is, is that the government, they do have the power to tax you. Okay. And um, I actually had a little shot earlier today. One of my, uh, one of my keyboards that I use broke and I got online to eBay and I was bidding and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to make a good deal on this. This is a great steal. I got this keyboard for cheap. And then I won the bid and I was so ecstatic because I won the bid and I got to pay it. And then I saw the tax rate and I was like, you got to be kidding me. I might as well just went down to Walmart or Office Depot and bought one because I paid more because of the taxes. Okay. Uh, so in the situation is understand uh, that it's mainly the purpose of taxes and the, the justification they give you is it's to raise funds to meet government needs. Now, we can all have a whole debate on that. I mean, we could probably all sit here and be, well, you know, who should be determining where the money's going and all of this. But the whole purpose is, is that it's to raise funds to pay for the governmental needs. Okay, and that's mainly what we want to focus on. Uh, now, the reason that we talk about taxation in real estate is because if you own real estate, guess what? 
you get to pay property taxes. And if you buy real estate, you get to pay other types of taxes. So no matter what you do, you're having to pay taxes. Doesn't that just sound wonderful, Aiden? Just everything you do, you get to pay taxes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So in that situation, you're going to get hit. And, and guess what? They're going to hit you the highest most of the time on your property because why? Why, do, why in the world would the government want to hit you high on taxes on your property? Because what can you not do with your property? You can't hide your property. For example, Travis, could you go out and could you go and do a particular service or sell a certain product and Aiden pay you in cash? Could you hide that cash? Oh, yeah. So in that particular situation, is the government getting their money out of it? No. There's a reason the government doesn't want you spending cash or having cash. There's a reason the government wants you putting cash into bank accounts. Because if they need to audit you, what can they do? They got records. Okay. They don't want you using an all-cash system. If you do, they can't trace it. It's hard for them to trace. So in those particular situations, you have to understand that they utilize the big emphasis that we use here in class is that we use taxes and we focus it on properties because it cannot easily be hidden. If you own a house, Aiden, it's public record and we can see it just by watching that you owe in the house. That's why they can hit you. And that's where they hit you is in taxes. That's one of the governmental powers. Another power is the police power. Okay. Again, it is to preserve order. Now, if you want to say yay or nay that they actually do a good job on it, that's a completely different debate there too, okay? But it's the purpose is to preserve order, okay? It's also to protect the public health, safety, and morals. And it also is to promote the general welfare. So the government does put certain restrictions. Me and Mr. Grossman were in a closing today. And while we were in the closing, the, uh, the closer actually sat down and had a survey and had pulled it out and had explained to them why there are setback lines and was educating the client. And Stefan was like, you just spoke about that last night. And I said, yep. Yeah. And as she was explaining it, I saw it make even more sense to Stefan because she was saying, you know, the reason that we not only have setback lines and also building setback lines isn't simply to go over there and to take away your property. But if you really honestly you think about it, think of it from this situation. If Aiden, say this entire room here was your property and you built to the four corners of your property, okay? And Travis and Stefan on both sides of you did the same thing. What happens if there's a fire behind you in your backyard? How's the, how's the people, how's the, the fire people gonna get through to the backyard to, to get the fire put out? can't unless they go through your house right and, and do you want them going through your house no no you don't want them going through your house so in this particular situation what happens is is that we have setback lines just in case there is a need to access behind or in front of the property okay there's reasons behind all of these different situations but again these are two of the, the ones. Now, if you're taking notes, you may want to put down PETE, P-E-T-E, -E, okay? What we've done here is it's not perfectly in order like the other ones. But what have we already done already? We've talked about the P of PETE, and we've talked about the T of PETE, okay? Well, what do you think the next one's going to end up being? Infinite domain. That's one of your E's, okay? And this is where the government or a public entity can come in and take personal or private property for public use. So say, for example, that Mr. Keith, he has a house and the, uh, they're wanting to build a Aguilane Expressway. And Keith's house happens to be right smack dab in the middle of the Aguilane Expressway. What do you think is going to happen to Mr. Keith's house, Aiden? They're taking it. They're going to take it. 
and they're going to use eminent domain. So in that situation is, it's a way that the government and the public entities can come in and take private property. Now, does it mean, though, that they get to take it and keep it? No, what have they got to do for this, for keep? They've got to give keep fair market value. But here's where you have a problem. And I know Mr. Keith's listening in right now with me on this. Here's the thing. Yes, sir. <laughs> So, Mr. Keith, you've gone in. Let me let me ask you, Mr. Keith, since you you got your your microphone on, I want to ask you this question: Do you want to pay the most? And that that comes back to this slide here, to the very first one. Do you want to pay the most taxes, sir, if you own property? No. Oh, of course not. None of us would. Nobody wants to pay the most taxes. It's crazy. Okay. So, Mr. Keith says, I don't want to pay the most taxes. So he's going to go down to the tax man or woman. And do what? He's going to tell them, I paid the bare minimum for this house. Yeah, I know I'm not going to tell the tax man or woman that I paid $500,000. i am going to tell them I paid two hundred. dollars Okay? So I pay the bare minimum. All right? But here's the problem. Is when it comes to eminent domain, they go off of the assessed value. So he might have paid $500,000 for that house. And now all of a sudden, they're coming to take his property from him, and they will take it through eminent domain, but only give him $200,000 because he told the appraisal district, what? That his house is only worth $200,000. So in that situation is, you got to be very careful there, Mr. Keith, that if you know or hear that there may be a potential of an infinite domain or you're representing a client for anybody that's also listening, you always want to tell that client, you better go get your house reassessed because the fact is, is you want it to get reassessed as high as possible, but you better make certain that you're 100% that your house is going to be in the infinite domain because once you reassess a house up, good luck getting it back down. Okay. So you got to be very, very careful. Okay, in regards to this. So again, as it shows, is it's the taking of private property for economic development or enhancement of tax revenues. Okay, it's going- I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Is that the same thing that happened at the border of uh, Texas and Mexico with Donald Trump when he was yes, building that? Huh? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. I was just curious about that, thank you. Exactly. Good, good example there, by the way, Ms. Leela. Very good example. When they go in at any point, does the government try to take your property? They are utilizing and exercising infinite domain. It's where they come in and they will show that they are going over and that they are using it for, and now the key word here is for the public benefit, health, or safety. Okay. And the reason in that situation how Donald Trump was able to do that was because he classified it as safety. I, I'm worried about it, so it's safety. But see, this is where you got to be very careful. And this could go into, like I said, we could have a debate on this and all of that too. But you got to be careful because, like I tell people all the time, is you don't want the government to do, be too powerful. We need the government to be powerful, but we don't need them being too powerful where they could end up saying anything. Imagine with COVID, imagine if they would have all of a sudden said, well, you know what, we're going to take all of y'all's properties and we're going to put y'all all in this one concentration camp and we're going to end up, we're taking your properties, you know, so that we can end up better controlling the situation. Now, of course, that's an, an extreme, it's a very far extreme, but if you allow a government to continue to push the, the, the line, as they say, you give that government what? More control. Okay? And that's why a lot of times with eminent domain cases, it's sad to say, but most of the time, who has most of the money? And Aiden, if they want to take your house, how many people are you, sir? One. You're one. And if Travis is the government, how many attorneys does Travis have? Thousands. If not more. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands. thousands. It may be even millions. Yeah. Okay. So how many attorneys can you afford? Uh, zero right now. 
I mean, and how many can Travis afford? Plenty. Plenty, <laughs> right? So in that situation is, what do you think your chances of actually winning in, in an infinite domain case? Slender. Pretty slim. Okay. So in these situations, you got to be very careful. However, there is the landlord's bill of rights. And there are certain terminologies and certain things that are protected under these bill of rights. The government has to, by all means, attempt not to mess with the structure itself. Does that make sense? So that means if we're going to create this Aggieland Expressway, and those of you that are in Houston, what I'm talking about is it is 249, okay? 249 is going to stretch to Highway 6, where it's going to cut down the commute where you can get from Bryan College Station to Houston instead of an hour and a half in approximately 45 minutes to an hour. So it's cutting it almost in half. All right. But the thing is, is that when they do this, the whole purpose is what? Is that we want to make certain that as we're making that path, we want to try not to affect any structures. Okay. That's the key thing. So again, when we're talking about Bill of Rights, there are going to be certain things that the government has to try to avoid. What were you going to say, Travis? I said that's why it goes to the planner as well, not that the planner as well. Yep, that, and it is. It's yeah. truthful. It's because it's a bunch of just open yeah. space. Yeah. Okay. Versus, could you imagine <laughs> had they have gone through straight through, a, straight through Navasota? Yeah. You know, you have a city there. They have to make certain that they go to the least affected area. The next biggest one, okay, I know when Aguilan Expressway was all getting done, that was a big thing. Now, the newest one that's coming up is the high-speed uh, the high speed rail, okay? And that's one going to connect Dallas, Houston, Austin, and eventually San Antonio. And people in Houston can be into Dallas within an hour. So you get on that train, and you can get on it and be in Dallas within an hour, and you can get back. Okay, because people do business in Houston and Dallas. So they need to be able to get there quickly. But that again, scares me. That scares you? Because I think about, I, my mind goes in weird directions and I think about terroristic things yeah. when you use mass transit like that. That's true. That is very true. I never actually thought about that. Because I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, and that would be a very good point. Well, and it's a good point because if you think about it, it's the same situation is if people want to take out a target, they're going to take out the target that has the largest amount of people. And if you have a very large system like that, you can take it out pretty quickly. You know, when I was, Miss Lila, when I was actually in D.C., um, that's mainly how you get around is on transit. Uh, there's a train system, and that's basically, you don't drive up in D.C., you mainly park and you get to your hotel, you park, and you walk or you travel through train. And uh, and that was something that always kind of came to my mind at that time was, you know, what happens if somebody was to destroy this? They could really shut down the entire country itself. So, again, very good points. And these are things that have to be argued when you're in court. These are things when people are challenging infinite domain and all, is how are we going to challenge these individual situations? You know, what exactly are the concerns? Because see, just like with a judge, a judge doesn't know anything. They're a third party neutral person. They need to hear all of this because just like you and I, we all have different opinions. It's the judge's job to be neutral to hear both sides, okay? Now, of course, infinite domain, the entity is taking, or the entity taking must make a good faith offer. And offer, oftentimes that good faith offer is your assessed value, okay? But as real estate agents, Mr. Grossman and Mr. Aiden and Mr. Travis, is the assessed value a fair characteristic of what the property's really worth? No. If you can find it like 70% of what it's actually worth. It's about 70%, 70 to 80% most of the time of what it's approximately worth. It's never exactly on it. And if you can normally find a listing for exactly what the assessed value is, either one or two things happen. 
the person was being truthful and actually told them what they sold it for or purchased it for, or they ended up, they are not represented by an agent and don't know what it's actually worth. Okay. Again, no agreement. If there cannot be any agreement, then there's going to be what's called a condemnation suit. And this is where the court will appoint three special commissioners. Okay. Again, there has to be adequate compensation. So it's the market value of the property plus certain reimburse, uh, reimbursements for certain damages. But again, very reasonable is the key word. We're not punishing, we're only allowing reasonable reimbursements, okay? Now, of course, you may appeal to a trial by judge or jury, but again, in that situation, if you're Aiden and you're currently your one man person and you only make 40 or 50,000 a year, <clears throat> Mr. Aiden, do you have the capital to continually challenge this through the court system? No. No. So they wear you out relatively quickly. Make sense? Now, the next one is what we call a sheet. That's your other part of Pete. And a sheet is where it is. If the situation, if a person dies without a will, they have no heirs, no nothing. So, Aiden, let's say you're a loner, you're by yourself, and you have a million dollars, okay, and you die, your money goes to the state. All right? So, in that particular situation, it's the reversion to the state when the owner dies without heirs or a will, and the owner is absent for seven years or their whereabouts is unknown. So for example, say Stefan here, Mr. Millionaire up here, he's got a house that he owns in Galveston, Travis, okay? So he's got a house in Galveston that he owns and he lives in College Station. You don't, you've seen uh, Stefan the very first time you moved in seven years ago, but have not seen or heard or anything from Stefan and the yard's never mowed, it's just overgrown. It's just a building that's just sitting there and it just sits there. And you've tried to reach out to Stefan and email him email, and he just no response or anything. Well, if the owner is absent for seven years and you can't guarantee where his presence is, then guess what happens? It can revert back to the state. So in that situation is the owner's absence for seven years or their whereabouts is unknown would you also revert it back. Now the proceeds from the sale is going to be deposited into the foundation school fund. It does not go in the treasury fund. It actually goes into the school fund. So your house, Mr. Grossman, if you don't take care of it, they would sell it, take the money, and put it into the school fund. Okay. So that's the end of Pete. Okay, that's the end of the governmental powers. So Pete's now done. Okay. So now our next one that we're going to talk about is going to be the freeholds estate. Okay. So in that particular situation, this is now we're talking about ownership, how you own a property. So the, the best way to own property is called freehold fee simple. So if you want to own property, you want to own it freehold fee simple. Okay, so that makes sense. It is the highest interest in real estate. The owner is entitled to all the rights, which are those bundle of rights, and they have full, complete ownership, okay? There is no time limit on its existence, and it runs forever, all right? So it does not disappear. It stays forever, and you pass it to your heirs or by will, okay? So if you own a property, you have no liens, you, you own it 100%, you're said to have freehold be simple. Okay, now we're going to talk here in a minute, but what would be somebody like you, Mr. Uh, Travis and Mr. Aiden? You currently are what? Do you own your properties y'all live in? No, what are y'all doing? Leasing. You're leasing. So what do you kind of estate would you have? Well, remove that word free and put what? Lease. Leasehold estate. Okay, so if you're leasing a property, you have a leasehold. That's what I tell my students all the time. If it's free and clear, then it's a freehold, okay? But if you're leasing it, it's a leasehold, all right? 
So in that situation is the highest form is always going to be free hold, free fee simple. Now there is another type, which is called a freehold estate, and it has a defeasible fee estate. And this is where the estate may be divested or defeated on occurrence or non-occurrence of a specific event, okay? So in this particular situation is, is this comes back to kind of like what we talked last night about, where we were discussing basically about, you know, if you don't fulfill a certain agreement or you don't fulfill your duties, Mr. Aiden, then in this particular situation is the estate may be divested or defeated on the occurrence or non-occurrence of a specific event. And so what happens is, is there's a determinable fee estate, which in also can lead to a fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. And what all this comes back to is, comes back to that statement we said yesterday. I tell you, Mr. Aiden, you know, I'm your dad, and I say, hey, Aiden, I'm buying you a $500,000 house. You don't have any parties. You don't drink. You don't do anything. You maintain a, a 4.0 GPA. I'll give you this house free and clear. I'll give you this $500,000 house, but only at the time you graduate. You have to graduate 4.0, and you also can never drink in your life. If you fail to fulfill that specific event, it can revert, okay? It can be terminated, it can be defeated. So again, there are many different types of freehold estates, okay, different ways. Again, a determinable fee estate is going to em or end immediately on the occurrence of a designated event. So in this particular situation, see how we use keywords in the deed? So long as, until, while, during, this will give you a determinable fee estate. So I could say something as, so long as uh, Aiden continues to have a 4.0 GPA, he can have ownership of this property. At the moment that he ends up, he fails to have a 4.0, he's no longer entitled to this property. Well, guess what? First time you get lower than a 4.0, what happens? It's going back to me. And after you drop below a 4.0, can you ever go back to a 4.0? No. Okay. Dropping classes left and right. That's why you're dropping classes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in that situation is you got to be very careful. Okay. Again, the title would revert back to the original grantor, his or her heirs, or a third party. So I can maybe state if I'm dead, I may could state that and, and this this guys and gals is how crooked things can or not crooked, but how people are. Say, Travis, you don't like, Stefan is your son, okay? And so Stefan's your son, Travis, and you don't like the girl that Stefan's currently dating, okay? So you tell Stefan that you've put in your will that, or in the deed and all, that when you pass, the house goes to Stefan. Subject to, he does not marry that woman. What's that mean? Yeah, when you when you die and Stefan gets that deed and everything in the will, he's going to say, what the heck are you doing? It happens. I'm working in a law firm that dealt with stuff like that. There would be people that come in and they would sit down and say, they can have my estate as long as they don't marry that guy or that woman. Okay? Or as long as... They don't do X, Y, and Z. Things happen like that, okay? But again, there are different things, but here's what it comes down to. It ultimately is your property. You have the right to do what you want with your property. I have one lady that I had that used to come in our office years and years and years ago. She may, God forbid, be dead by now. She was an old, old, old lady at that time. But, um, but she ended up, she was going to leave her estate all of her money, she had a very nice estate, to her son. But she hated her son's wife. And so she said she was going to have one last deal before she died to try to get her son to break up with or divorce his wife. And so in her estate, he could have the estate and everything that she had if he would divorce his wife. So he could have it all. If he would divorce his wife. 
Otherwise, it was going, she had two little puppies. It was going to go into a trust and there was a lady that was going to basically inherit the dogs. And then that lady was going to be able to main, basically take care of the dogs with the estate for those two dogs. And then what was ever left over was to go to, there was some national like organization for pet rescue and all. So I don't know what happened with that one. I, I was pretty much out of that. I, I had left and, and moved on. But yeah, she, uh, that, that was one of those wheels that I was helping the attorney write. And, whew, that was a, that was one of the more complicated ones. But again, it comes down to the situation is you get to determine what you want to do because it's your assets, it's your stuff. Okay. So that's one of the positives in regards to you get to determine what you want to do with it. Now, a fee simple subject to a condition subsequent is where it's on occurrence or not occurrence of a stipulated condition, the grantor or heirs reserve the right of reentry. Okay. The grantor or heirs go to court or the court orders a return of title. And the key words in that deal is going to be on the condition that provided that or if. Okay. So when you're going through deeds, now let me explain something here. When you're going through deeds, should you, Travis, if you get a deed and you see these words, should you tell your client, oh, yeah, Aiden, uh, yeah, that's a uh, defeasible fee simple with a fee simple subject to condition subsequent of a freehold estate. Should you tell your client that? What's that possibly on the verge of? Or if not, already passed over? No, unauthorized practice of law. You can't this you cannot state that because you would be practicing law. Okay? That's right. We we simply if a person wants to know what a deed says, you need to speak with your counsel. Talk to an attorney. Okay? Don't ever go in and try to go and explain it. If they got questions, go talk to their legal counsel. Now this one here is my favorite one. And I'm I, I like I said, I've worked for a law firm. I've dealt with real estate for years and years and years, probably well over 20 years now. And uh, one thing that I can tell you is that what we used to always advise our clients was if your parents, and this is going to go to older, like if your parents are say in their 70s, six, late 60s, early 70s, you may want to sit down with your parents and you may want to ask them if they would be interested in creating a life estate. And now this only applies if they own the property outright. Did you hear me again? It only applies if you own the property outright. So, no so if there's any mortgage lien on it, this can't happen. Okay? It has to be paid in full. But what happens is, is say for example, Mr. Uh, Garrett, Say, and, and all this, I'm knocking on wood real quick so that this doesn't happen. So I knocked on wood and all. But say that your, your dad, your mom's already, will say, passed. Your dad's the last one alive. He's paid off all of his property. He's got all this stuff paid in full. He is, you know, 75 years of age. And, uh, and his health has been deteriorating year over year. Okay. You may want to talk to your father and ask him, Dad, can we go ahead and create a life estate? And what that does is it is ending up, it is putting your dad as basically a tenant of the property for the remainder of his life. So Garrett at no point can force his dad out. Okay, Garrett can never tell his father that he has to get out of the property. What happens is, is it guarantees his father he can live in that property for as long as he wants, okay? as long as Garrett's father wants to. But the minute that Garrett's dad passes away, the property automatically reverts to Garrett. Now, what does that do? Well, that skips probate. Okay, You don't have to go to probate to get the property because the property already rolled over into your name. So do you have to hire an attorney, Travis, to get the, get the house now? Do you have to go spend court cost fees? 
Do you have to do any of that stuff? Do you have to be taking time off of work and all that stuff? No. So what happens is, is it is a method that is utilized in estate planning to allow everything to purpose or to, to purposely roll over the way that the person wants it to go. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you still have to pay inheritance tax on it? You were the owner of the property at that time. You might have had to pay some fees in the beginning, mm -hmm. but most of the time, if it's done properly, they're buying the property, not inheriting it. Yeah. So there is normally no inheritance tax. Makes sense? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. With this uh, life estate, is that only for like one person? What if that person has multiple children? You can split it. You can do ten, basically different tenancies and commons or joint tenancy. So if you're say say for example that it was your mother, Miss Leela, and she mm. has four kids, okay, she can say that I am going to pass my property in, in an interest of 25, 25, 25, 25 to each of my three children. So oh, okay. so in that particular situation, each one of you would have a fourth of the interest of that property. <clears throat> so you could do it in that method as well, or your mom might just say, you know what, Leela, you're you're the child that I want to get the house. And, you know, it's between me and you, and I want you to get it. And she can do that too. So mm -hmm. in that situation, it is completely up to how y'all want to deal with it. Me personally, I always highly recommend it. The reason why is it locks in your interest into the estate. So God forbid, and I, like I said, I've worked in all different areas of law and I've seen a lot of things happen, especially when it comes down to probate the will. There are times that some people say, for example, Leela, you've done everything you can to take care of your mom, but your brother say, for example, it has possession of her money or is on her account and he's not a trustworthy person. Well, he could go down and, and take all the cash out and run off with it. Well, then, mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you got to go chase them down and you got to try to collect the money and good luck getting it and all of this. Well, with the life estate, if it was split 25, 25, 25, 25, well, guess what? If he runs off with the money, you could go to probate and take his 25% away from him and split it amongst the other three, if you see what I'm saying. So, how do you get that started with life estate? Do you just you just, all you've got to do is you just have to talk with you. Number one, always is talk with the, the family member. Uh, mm -hmm. And then after that, you just go down to a, an attorney that basically writes a will and they will draft up all of the paperwork. They'll get everything together. Uh, it normally takes, depending on how busy the attorney is, we used to draft them within about a week. We could have all the paperwork together, have it all ready and have you sitting down in the, in the conference room ready to sign within approximately a week. So oh, okay. it's, it's relatively quick. It's a quick process, uh, but it's something that will save you years and years of headaches. Um, we had one case I had came on when I was working at the law firm. Uh, when I had came on, the case had already been locked up in probate for six years, six years when I had came on. And I worked for that attorney for three and a half and the case had just got resolved about three months before I left. So almost nine or almost 10 years, it was locked up because they ended up, they were fighting over the estate. And the sad part is, is majority of the money went to the attorney's fees. So it's always best, and, it, and don't get me wrong, it's a very hard topic to have a discussion with. Nobody wants to sit down and talk about, I'm gonna die and this is how I want my estate broken down. Nobody wants to have that discussion. But if you truly love your children, you, you're going to have that discussion because you want to make certain. I mean, my mama or my dad is currently going through that right now. They're already, you know, my grandmother just basically said, all of you get one third. Well, it's already a mess because you can't really get a third. You know, like I tell people all the time is, how do you get a third of a, a couch? You know what I'm saying? Are you supposed to cut it into, you know, into thirds and everybody takes it with them? I mean, it's not going to happen like that. Okay. So it's always best in that situation to have those discussions because it makes life 10 times easier guys and gals, because it just makes it so much smoother. 
you know, when my grandfather died, he was the only one that actually listened to me. And I showed him how to do it and what to do. And I helped him get the stuff together. And, you know, any questions we had, I was working for an attorney and the attorney would advise me and tell me what to do and we'd go do it. And, you know, when he passed away, my grandmother was able to grieve and not have to worry about, oh, I got to go get this change of account. I got to go do this and I got to go do that. But it was all done. So there was no need for a probate, you know. And so in that situation is it just makes things smoother is what I always tell people. And a lot of people are freaking out. They'll be like, well, I, I don't want to go, you know, uh, and, and do a will. It costs too much. No, actually, nowadays you can do a will for about 250 to 500 dollars. And that 250 to 500 dollars is well worth it. OK, well, well worth it. Trust me on that. Um, <clears throat> But again, like it says, it's created. A conventional life estate is created by the agreement of the parties, and it's stipulated in a deed. Okay. Uh, again, there is the life of the owner. The owner gets to stay as long as they want. Uh, then there's also they do have the life of the designated person, and that's often going to be the individual that's going to be able to revert it. Who's the new owner? Okay. And the key terms within this is going to be life uh, life tenant a remainder interest, reversionary interest, and waste. Okay, those are your key terms. And now a legal life estate, this is a little different in regards to this one. Okay, in regards to a legal life estate versus a conventional life estate, a conventional is where you have it drafted up. A legal life estate is created by the operation of law, and it is oftentimes your homestead. Now, I highly recommend that if you own your property, and I'm not talking full and clear, I'm just saying you bought a property and it's your main residence, you need to file homestead exemption. I was actually shocked, shocked when I had looked the last time that approximately only 75% of people know about homestead exemptions. 75%. There's 25% of people that own a home that don't know that they can get an exemption on taxes. Okay, that's where it is. Our job as real estate professionals to make certain that our clients are aware of this matter and they're not blindsided. You see what I'm saying? Okay, it helps your clients not only from tax breaks, but it also in Texas, a creditor cannot force the sale of your home. So if I, if you're a credit card company, Aiden and I own my house and my house is a million dollars, okay? And I don't pay your credit card bill. As long as I'm homestead exempted, I got a shield around my house that you can't touch it. How you like that? Uh, I, mean, I don't like it. You wouldn't like it as the bank, right? No. But for me, I love it because you can't take my stuff. That's why one thing that doctors and lawyers do all the time, they don't have multiple houses because you can only have one homestead. So what do they do? They just have a huge house and end up, they have this huge mansion of a house that is homestead. And if they can't pay their debts, not my problem. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's imperative that you know this information because it protects you in your endeavors. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, as you can see here, this kind of gives you an example of a conventional life estate. So you have the grantor. So for example, say Miss Leela, this is your mom, okay? Your mother's the grantor and she ends up, there's a change in title where she goes from grantor to life tenant, okay? Now when, God forbid, her mother was to pass away, so when the life tenant passes away, it would then go to Miss Leela. You see how that works. So it goes from a grantor to a life tenant, which then when the life tenant passes, it then goes to Miss Leela, which would be the remainder. Okay. Now a reversionary life estate, okay, is a little bit different. It's where in this particular situation, the grantor becomes a life tenant, but then can also have the right to do what? take it back if they want, okay? You gotta be careful with that one because this first one cannot be undone. This one can't, okay? 
Now, what about this legal life estate in regards to homestead? Well, it's created, of course, by the operation of law, and it's to protect the family against eviction by, and the key word here, general creditors. Okay? We don't want, if I go charge $1,000, $2,000 on my credit card, and I don't pay Aiden back, we don't want Aiden to have the power to force the sale of my house over a thousand or two thousand dollars and put this family out on the streets. Okay, that's ridiculous. All right. So in the situation is, is it's to protect the family against eviction by general creditors. Now, if Aiden is my mortgage company, can he now force me out, Mr. Travis? If I don't pay my mortgage, can he force me out? Heck yeah, because he's financing my house, all right? But what also is the difference? How much money probably have I borrowed from you? A thousand dollars? No. How, many, how much have I borrowed? A couple of hundred thousand. Okay, imagine if I bought a five hundred thousand dollar house. That's a lot of money, okay? So in these particular situations, it allows for the party, if it is a big amount of money, we want them to be able to get them out. Okay. But again, we don't want just general creditors because I didn't pay you $500 and you're forced to sell my house. We don't want that happening. Okay. It also protects the spouses by requiring that both husband and wife have to sign the deed or mortgage. I had a, a closing today with Mr. Grossman and we sat down and the husband and wife were there. Well, it was a VA loan. It was in the husband's name, but she still had to be there. Her name was nowhere else. Her name was not on the promissory note. Her name was not on the promissory note. But guess where her name was? Her name was on the deed. Because if he doesn't pay the mortgage, what's that mean? We don't want her staying in the house because he failed to pay. So we have to kick both of them out and not just one. Okay, that's why we have both sides. Again, there are constitutional rights in property owned and leased, and they cannot be waived. And the occupancy automatically creates it. So there is no legal filing that's required. However, while it's not required to be filed, it's always advisable to because of the fact of the matter is this. You don't want to have to pay an attorney to show that it's a homestead. Does that make sense? Okay. Now again, a life estate, when we're talking about a legal life estate, basically will remain for the surviving spouse and the minor children, okay? So if a legal life estate, if the surviving spouse is there and there's minor children, it will continue on a homestead, all right? Not for a conventional, but a legal life. The proceeds from a sale are exempt for six months, and if separate per, uh, property of one spouse. So if it is separate property of one particular spouse, the husband and the wife both must still sign the lien and the deed. Now if the only owning spouse dies, then the surviving non-owning spouse is going to obtain what's called a conditional life estate. And again, this protects against the forced sale with certain exceptions, okay? Now, these are the rules currently. You can have a, a home, okay, these are, this is your exceptions here. You can own a lot or contiguous lots that do not exceed 10 acres if it's urban, okay? So you, front, or Travis, could actually own 10 acres within College Station, and in that situation, it may include both a home and a place of business, and you're exempted. So you could have 10 acres in, in downtown College Station, okay, with a nice big house and a business on it, and it is homestead exempted. Pretty nice, right? Yeah. That thing's probably going to be worth a nice chunk of change, okay? That's like going to Houston. Yeah. And, and downtown Houston having 10 acres with a house and a business on it, okay? It's going to be worth some money, but guess what? It's exempted, okay? You notice there's no price point on either of these. Now, if you're in the rural area, you're outside of College Station, you're outside of Houston or Austin, 
you can have up to 200 acres if you're a family and it's exempt. If you're a single person, you can have up to 100 acres and it's exempt. Imagine that, 100 acres all for you and nobody can take it from you, okay? That's another positive there. Now, what are some what we call foreclosable liens on, home, uh, on homesteads? Well, these are the ones that are allowing for them to force the sale of your property, okay? You fail to pay your property taxes. You don't pay your property taxes, they're forcing that sale, it's called a tax sale. If there is a purchase money mortgage and it's not being paid, guess what? They're going to force that sale. Again, some homeowners associations, and yes, I'm not kidding, HOAs can also assess liens on the map. The HOA themselves can assess a lien. If there's any other types of liens that are owed, you also could, in certain situations, have to force the sale. If you refinance, there's a refinance of a lien against the homestead, that also can be challenged as well and also be part of it. So again, all of these give you the breakdown of how they are or could be the force of a foreclosable sale, okay? Now, the biggest and most utilized one is the mechanics lien, okay? And what I mean by this is this is where I was to call, say, for example, I call uh, Mr. Jacob to come over and build me a pool, okay? And so he comes over and he builds a pool for me, and after I do everything and he finishes the job, I don't pay him. Well, guess what? Did he provide services? Yes. Did he complete the job? Yes. He has fulfilled his duties, so he could file a mechanics lien against my property and force the sale for what purpose? To get paid. Okay. So it's based on a written contract. Again, it must be signed and acknowledged by both spouses before the work has been done or the material has been delivered. Very key. It cannot be or it cannot be signed until five days after the loan application. Okay, it may be rescinded up to three days after signing, and it must be signed at an office of a third-party lender, attorney, or title company. Okay, and they don't play around with this. Trust me, they don't. Not by any means. There also can be foreclosable liens in regards to home equity loans reverse mortgages, and refinance of personal property liens that are secured by a manufactured home to a lien on real property, okay? Now, how do we have the termination of a homestead right? Well, if the party dies, that's clear as day, we already established that if you die, it's done, okay? If you sell the property, you don't get to keep holding one on a house that you no longer own. Or if you abandon it, you simply just leave it. And that's basically not only, we're not talking about just walking away. We're talking about just simple discontinuance of use. Okay. Intention not to use it again as a home. If Stefan owns a house and he decides, yeah, I no longer, I'm not worried about this. I'm not going to make this my home. Okay. Well, guess what? He said he's not going to use it again as a home, so he's terminated it. So you can also have to turn it into a business or something like that. That's intent. You're changing the intent of it, so it's gone. Notice of abandonment can be recorded. Stefan, if he wanted to go the extra step, could go file an abandonment. He could say, I abandoned my property. I no longer want it. I paid it off, but I don't want it anymore. Wouldn't that be smart, y'all? Yeah, I paid 30 years of my mortgage now. I don't want it no more. Woohoo! Sound like a plan, right? Okay. So again, this breaks down kind of the different interests. And you'll see here at the top that the freehold estate, of course, like it shows you, is the highest and best. Then, of course, it goes down and it shows you fee simple and life estate because both of these have to be what? There can't be any liens on them. Okay. But as you can see, they also go down. Each one goes down. So fee simple goes to fee simple over here to the left, or defeasible fee, which then breaks down into two different types of condition and reverter rights. Your life estates can either be conventional, 
or it can be legal. You know, the only legal one is your homestead. And then, of course, you have your conventional life that can be ordinary or with a remainder or reversionary. Okay. Now, what exactly is this thing called an encumbrance? Well, an encumbrance is basically something that takes away some of your rights in the property, some of your ownerships. So it is the lien is going to be the security for the repayment of a debt. And it's not always just going to be a mortgage. Okay. I could have a lien for many different things. I could have a tax lien against my property. I could have a mechanics lien. I could have a mortgage lien. I could have a lot of different liens. Okay. It is a repayment. It's a security. They're using it as collateral. Okay. Now the deed restriction or restrictive covenant is basically it's private agreements that are imposed by a developer. A developer may set certain restrictions. They can restrict the use of land by either lot size, building lines, type of architecture, home size, and etc. Y'all have been in one that I was selling a property in a multi-million dollar property community in Austin. And uh, they literally had restricted down to how many trees had to be in the front yard and what type of tree. Okay. And it had to be so many feet from the other tree, but also from the structure of the house. And there were people that were in the HOA that would come around and measure this to make certain that you're following it correctly. Okay. And if you don't, they'll find you. Right. So in that particular situation, yes, developers can put very strict restrictions on certain properties. Yes, that like it can't be more than like a fifty dollar fine, right? Oh no, no, sir, it can get very, very expensive, very, very quickly. Ours is in Amarillo. They have the same thing, and our we are allowed to have two to three trees in our front yard, mm -hmm. and they have to be eight feet off of the sidewalk. They have to be headed eight feet off the sidewalk. Yep and at least 15 feet, 15 feet apart. Yep. And it's $100 a day if they're planted incorrectly. That's right. Dang, man. That's right. That's right. Insane. Yeah, in Oak Ridge, you have to have like a permit to build a fence. Yep. And they have a guy that just drives around and makes sure that no one's building a fence without a permit. Yep. And if you do, you have to tear it down, you get fined, and then you have to reapply to get a new one built. These people sound full of themselves. Oh no, the best one was my cousin lived in a in a HOA and uh, my cousin's husband is from New York, so they do what they want. Okay, that's that's how they look at it. And he came down here and he wanted a shed in his backyard. And so he decided he got all the material and he got out there and he built the shed and he didn't finish it. He got probably about 40, 50 percent done. And um, and that he had done the site, which luckily he did the, the siding as he was kind of building it around. Well, he did the siding that faced the street. And uh, once they saw that the siding did not match his house, they were hit with a warning notice that they have to tear down the, the structure, number one, because the, the structure could not be viewable from the road. It had to be behind the house. So the, the shed had to be behind the house, not to the side. And also the choice that he was using for the hardy plank did not meet the specifications that were approved by the restrictions. So he had seven days to destroy the, the structure and move it or be faced with a $200 a day fine. So, yeah. You can have a lot of these, and that's why HOAs, a lot of people don't want an HOA. Some love them, some hate them, okay? But you gotta think about it. If you're not an HOA, what stops, Stefan, if I'm living in one house and you can move in next door, what stops you from going over and throwing parties every night? The police. Not always. If you've been a college student, what do police do when they come to you? Turn it down, and they leave. And then they ask, is anybody under age? And they start. Well, but the thing is, in that situation, is you got to be very careful. But the, the purpose is, that's another thing you got to advise your client, is do you really want to be in an HOA? Because HOAs can be very, very stringent. Okay? So you got to look at how much freedom do you want. Because when you I live in an HOA right now. 
How do you like it, Ms. Layla? There's some pros and cons. Uh, the pros down to like what you were talking about in regards to the noise. Um, some of our neighbors, I just call them interesting. And if you let them, you know, do what they want, it, their houses will probably look like the gingerbread house <laughs> as far as how they would paint it. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it would obviously impact your property when people have to see that eyesore or right. if they have overgrown grass. But the con, uh, obviously the con would be, it is very restrictive. You, we, my husband has a truck and he was turning too short as far as turning into the driveway and it dug up a small patch. It wasn't really big. And we got a nice little note that said, you better put, put some grass over that patch yep. or you're gonna get fined. And so of course now my husband is an excellent driver. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't had a problem since. <laughs> yep. My, my, my grandfather was on like the HOA board for his neighborhood for a while. Yeah. He eventually stopped doing it because he was like, he liked doing it. He, there was something for him to do now, but he's retired. And, you know, he knows the pros of it, but some of the people on the board were just insane. Where, oh, yeah, he lives across the street. I mean, it's a pretty big neighborhood that, you know, he has, I think, three or four acres of land. So, like, they're all, all the houses are kind of big on some. Some nice land or whatever, and the guy across the street from him owns a or runs a business out of his garage. Mm -hmm. um, so he has a big 18 wheeler that has snap on tools or whatever on the side of it. Yeah, he hardly moves that, but I mean, he'll drive in and out of the neighborhood and take stuff places and stuff wherever. Right. And they brought it up in a meeting that, like, you can't do they, they were like yelling about how crazy this guy is for trying to think he can do that in this neighborhood or whatever. And, he, and my grandfather was like, Does it bother any of y'all? Because I live across the street from the guy, and it's never been a problem for me. So I don't know why it's such a like. And he kind of had to like talk everybody down, and eventually they were like, "Oh, I guess that's a, I guess it really doesn't matter now." Then like, and they eventually let it go. But it's like he's like these people are insane. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah, and it is, and it's crazy because like I said, like with that one house, and even, even like you were saying with yours, when they start, it's fine to do certain things, but yeah. when you start, there's there's one community here in town that there's a an older lady. And she's retired. Well, she, which one is? No, 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 no. <laughs> she, she's, a, she's an older lady, and she's retired, and she walks around. So she'll have her coffee in the morning, and she gets up about 4 or 5 in the morning, has her coffee. No, no, it's not Linda. <laughs> but, but she gets up at 4 or 5 in the morning, she has her coffee, and then she goes for a walk with her dog. And on her walk with her dog, she takes pictures, a violation of every single house. Every day, I I used to I, I worked with the, the used to be president of that board, and he would tell me every single day he would get approximately five to ten photos from her every day of a different violation. She had nothing else to do. Yeah, she had nothing else to do. And so when he would look at them, it like Miss Leela, like you said, something minor. There's just a little bit of a rut right by the, the driveway. She would take a picture, and if something wasn't done she would literally go to the board and have a big fit and it's just like you know that it gets to a point that they don't understand when you're retired and you're working you know there's a difference when you have nothing going on you've got plenty of time but when you're working a job or running a business you don't got time for this go ahead what were you going to say i was going to say if if catching the curb pull into your driveway is a crime might be in jail right now i, <laughs> I hate that thing every single time well, that's why I'm glad I'm on a cul-de-sac, so I don't have to worry about running into you. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, there is. So there they are, didn't do nothing to that old lady. Nope. And she still he. So he actually, or the guy that was the president, resigned from the position because he was so tired of it, <laughs> and so now some other person's dealing with it. So, <laughs> I. Wow. It, I tell you, but you know, to me, I, like I told him, I said, I would purposely just be sitting outside of her front house in her front door and just be taking pictures. Every little thing, I would just sit there and take pictures. So, but I mean, yeah, there are people that have nothing going on in their life but to go and, and cause drama for other people. So, again, it comes back to, like I said, and, and when you talk to a person, when they go into an HOA, they need to understand. It's their duty to understand that there's a lot of restrictions, you know, and one thing I can tell you is I've shown houses in HOAs before 
and a person says, yeah, I don't like that shrubbery right there at, by the window. I want to tear that down. You know, when I buy the house, I'm just going to tear all that down. Well, sometimes you can't. Sometimes it has to stay there. So you have a duty to your client to express these things to them so that they are advisable of this and not unaware after the fact. Okay. Um, again, easements can also be another type of encumbrance. A license, and what we're talking about license, we're not talking about a real estate license. A license is this. I could say, Aiden, you are more than welcome to come to my house anytime and go into my tool shed and get whatever tools you need. Anytime, man. That's a license. I've given you the right to come to my property and go and end up help yourself. Okay. So have I ended up, have, if, if Travis is renting, say, a, a place or say I have two units on the property, Travis is, is renting one of them and I'm in the other, am I not limiting in some situations my access and Travis's access by allowing you to come on the property? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am because you're going to be coming in with a vehicle that may end up taking a parking spot. And if you're constantly coming back and forth, it could become a nuisance to some situation. So in these situations is the license could also be an encroachment. I mean, an encumbrance. An encroachment, and, and this, I'll tell you, it always catches me and I'm going to tell you for your test, be prepared. Encroachment and encumbrance will be confusing on the exam. Because they are not the same thing their classification of, of one of the other, okay? So an encumbrance is something that takes away or, or basically takes away usage, while an encroachment is a type of encumbrance, okay? So an encroachment is something like this. Say I live next to Miss Leela, okay? So Miss Leela lives next door to me, and I end up, you know, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to put my fence about another foot over because, you know, I just want a little bit bigger yard, and Miss Leela just has it open here. There's nothing there. So I'm just going to push mine over one foot so I have a little bit more walkway. And I don't consult with Miss Leela. Well, in that particular situation, guess what happens? First off, Miss Leela's going to beat me up. But what's going to happen is, is I've encroached on her property because I am now in her ownership. I mean, it, what I always say, I'm in her bubble. Okay. So when I do that, I am taking away her usage of that land and I'm benefiting myself. Now here's where it gets even more crazier. And this kind of comes back to the HOA thing. Travis ends up, he has a tree. He lives, he has a house and he's on the other side of Leela. Okay. And his tree is extending say four feet. So you know how the tree goes out, the canopy comes out. His tree is four feet over into Leela's yard. Even though the, the tree itself is in Travis's yard, the canopy is encroaching on Miss Leela's property. And guess what? Miss Leela has to be very careful because if that tree canopy is encroaching over Miss Leela's, say, driveway, and that tree crashes down, one of those limbs falls down and hits her car, guess what happens? It's on Travis, not Leela, because Travis should have been doing what? Trimming. Trimming it and maintaining it to make certain that it's not encroaching. Do you see how this works? That's another thing you got to tell your clients. In regards to easements, these are basically right of ways that are acquired by one party to use the land of another party for a specific purpose. Now, Mr. Grossman today, when we were in our closing, they talked about what's called an easement in gross. Do you remember what it was? Do you recall it? When she was talking about easement in gross? She was talking about um, if they wanted to, if, like if they needed to come, yeah, if they needed to dig utilities, if they needed to. Uh, That's correct. An, an, easement, fire department or something. an easement in gross is for utilities. So it's for water lines, electrical lines, or any other type of utility that's ran that's a, an easement in gross is what that is. Okay, and that's where your setbacks are. Okay, so when you see those setbacks, that's where they're talking about an easement in gross. There's also a, a different type of easement in regards to an, an easement in improvement. Uh, again, both of these are basically the access to property for certain reasoning. 
Now, let me say something else here. I want to explain to you. Let me double check and make sure. Yeah, here we go. Let's keep going with this. And an improvement is basically it's annexed to ownership and it's used for the benefit of another partial. Now, what this comes down to is this, is I want you to recognize, and I want you to think about this for a minute, okay? Say that y'all can't, can't physically see. So what I want you to do, if you've got a pen and paper, okay, if you don't, I want you to try to imagine this. I want you to take a pen and paper or just think of a rectangle, say this room right here, okay? What's going to happen is, let me see, y'all's camera's facing that away. So here's what we're going to do. Where the screen is, right there, that wall, that is actually going to end up, we're going to imagine that that's the driveway. Okay? So that right there, that's the road. Not the driveway, but the road. So the, the street goes this way. That makes sense. Okay? Now the driveway into this property that we're in, okay, the driveway is here where Stefan's at. And it goes in to approximately where the second row of chairs are, right here. So this is the house, right here. Where y'all are sitting back there, okay, that's just land, okay? So we have road, or the street, the driveway, house. Makes sense. Travis, you own this. You own this whole square thing here. Okay? So he owns this. Now, Travis goes over, and his wife divorces him, and, oh. and now ended up, he now needs to pay for those legal fees that Aiden charges him for the divorce. Okay? So Aiden... I've seen, I've seen billboards who do it for 250 <laughs> <laughs> For 500 yeah. Aiden's an expensive lawyer. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, so we go over here, and Travis has to, guess what? He's got to cut off... Right where his property, his house is, he's got to put a cut and he's got to sell that back part. Now, here's the problem. What's the only entrance into that property? Up here, where the street is. Okay? There's no access at the back of the room. There's no access on either side. The only way to get back there is to come through the street here, take the driveway, and access it back through there. Okay? So what ends up happening is, is that we have what's called a dominant and servitude estate. Okay? <coughs> the dominant estate is going to be the one that benefits from the easement. Okay, And what that means in this particular situation is where you're at, yes, where y'all are at in the back, you have to be served. You have to have service. Okay, So to have service, that means that this part at the front has to serve the back. To do that, we have to run the, the drive on back to the back part of the land or some other method. That's correct. So in this particular situation, the dominant estate is the back of the room, while the servitude estate is going to be towards the front. We're the one that has all the benefit, so we have to do what? We have to serve you, okay? So this is what creates a easement through an improvement, okay? It allows for you to end up, there is this, while you're going to sell it, you have to also sell an easement for that new owner to get back to their property. Does that make sense? And I just sold one of those today, too, by the way. We did that, too. Uh, there was a property that had just an old road, just a dirt road that got back to the property. That's basically what it is. It's a dominant conservative state. Now, again, this can also occur not just with land, but a party walk. Sometimes there can be two or duplex that each person owns the duplex individually, and there's a party walk. So each lot owner owns half. And each has an easement in the other half for support. So that means both people have to work together. Each pays half the building and maintenance costs. There's also an easement in gross, like we talked about. And it's the mere personal interest in land of another. And it's the right of ways for railroads, utilities, gas, electric, telephone, etc. 
Now again, they are created by either an expressed grant in a deed, meaning it's actually wrote out. There can be an expressed reservation in a deed. There can also be necessity. Sometimes there is a necessity. If y'all are landlocked, you've got to have a necessity. You've got to be able to get through, okay? So it's all owners have the rights of ingress and egress. They cannot be landlocked. Now there are some exceptions, but we cannot allow it to be where, well, Aiden, you bought the property, you got to take your helicopter to get to your house every day, okay? You can't do that. You have to allow them to be able to get in and out. They can also be created, this is the one I want everybody to peek up on. So if you fell asleep, here's another one you want to pick up on, especially if you have a property that a lot of children walk through or people walk through, you want to listen up here for a minute, okay? There's an easement called prescription. And we're not talking about a drug, okay? An easement by prescription is that it is the use of another's land for at least 10 years. So if, for example, let's say that Mr. Keith, he ends up, uh, you know, he, his mom ended up, he, she gave him their land, okay? And she inherited it. And there's always been these, the neighborhood kids always walk through, you know, they have say 10 acres and they always walk through half of their land to get back and forth into town, okay? So they walk back and forth, back and forth. It's always been happening. It's been continuous. The Keith never said anything to stop them, okay? He's just let them do it. They just keep walking back and forth, back and forth. Well, if they've done it for 10 years, guess what happens? It's now a legal easement and guess what? Keith's property is now split in half, okay? My father, I had to tell him because there was some kids that used to end up, they would walk. So we lived in a subdivision and there was some children that was on the other street. We were on this street and the, the mother and husband had separated. So the husband had got the nearest house, which was across the street from ours to rent. The wife stayed in this, so we were just a street over. And what happened was the kids would come across, come around and walk through back and forth between the houses. Instead of going around the street, they would walk between the houses, but would come through each neighbor's yard. And they kept doing it. And I was, I was young when it all happened. And uh, it was actually when I was taking my real estate classes, they talked about this. And I had raised my hand and I said, professor, I said, I got a question. I said, are you telling me that if a person keeps walking back and forth through your neighbor or through your yard, that after 10 years, they can end up, that's an easement? And my professor said, yes, yes, sir. They can, because it is continuous and it's exclusive. It was without anybody's approval, but nobody stopped them. It was also visible and open. And so in that situation, had my dad continued to let them walk through it, guess what? It would have became an easement. And normally when that happens, that allows the city to come in and do what? Put a sidewalk through that area, which then does what to your ownership of that land? Depletes it. Because in sometimes where they were actually walking was right along where the current setback line was. Well, if they put an easement there, what happens to that setback line? Pushes yeah. over, okay? So you have to be very, very careful in those situations. Also, there can be an easement by implication. The party's actions imply the intention to create an easement. This comes back to that implied, like we talked before. Remember, if you imply certain things, it can end up in that situation that can occur without you actually agreeing to it, okay? Again, this gives you that nice little breakdown like we were talking about uh, in regards to the servitude and the dominant estate. As you can see here, uh, you end up, you have this breakdown. You kind of have a public road at the very front. You have a house in the back, but the only way for that house or that person to get to their lot is they have to have an easement. Now, Travis, does it have to end up being exactly like this? Could you put it over here? Yeah, you can put it way to the far right. Or you put it way this far left, you know? Yeah, you could if you wanted to. But here's the thing. 
One thing you also have to classify is those setback lines. You can't run it straight on a setback line. Remember, you can't do that. So you have to put it as near to that setback line and then allow it. Now, could Travis be just angry at, at you, Aiden, you bought his property and he's ticked off that he's having to sell? Could, could Travis, could you put this drive for lot A? Could you put it all the way to the left and make him have to go all the way through his land to his house? Yeah. You could charge him with legal fees. Yeah, he charged him legal fees. Now look at it. He's, he's going to return the favor. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so in that situation is, yes, there are things that can happen like that. And there are very vicious people. A lot of times, some people won't even, they'll say, you know what, you can have your dad blasted easement. I ain't putting no dad blasted road in there for you. That's your problem. And they won't. They'll just say, here, you can drive on it, but this is all you get. They'll flag off some dirt, and that's all you get. Okay? They don't have to make it pretty for you. That's not their job. This also shows you that easement in gross, okay, how it can run through, where you can have utility lines that just happens to run straight through. Again, we talked about license where there's personal privilege to enter the land of another for specific purposes. It's permission that's usually given orally or informally. Like I said, hey, Travis, just, I mean, uh, Aiden, just help yourself to the toolbox, okay, man? It can be terminated by the licensor. I can call you later and say, yeah, I'm not going to let you do that no more, okay? Again, it's what? It's oral. It also ends on the death, though, of either party. Okay. And it can be revoked at the minute I sell it. So if I sell my property off to of Travis, you better not be going back over to that shit <laughs> and borrowing tools. Because I think Travis might, uh, might you might see some things flying when, when, you, uh, when you go over there next time. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, encroachments like we talked about. Is it going to be a building, a fence? or dry, uh, driveway that's illegally extended beyond the land of its owner can be disclosed by physical inspection of a property or by the survey. Uh, the neighbor may recover damages or secure removal of that part of encroachment on his or her property. Uh, now here's the key one. If it is longer than 10 years, guess what happens? It's a easement by prescription and it stays. Gotta be careful there. Now, what about water rights? Okay, and guess what, everybody? This is the last section we're talking about tonight, so y'all get to kind of calm down. We're almost done, all right? No, Mr. Grossman, we're not going another 50 slides tonight. No, I, I know that hurts your feelings, but no more, no more tonight. It certainly does not hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so a surface right, y'all going to need to know this. If you're writing notes, I want you to put down Ripperin equals River. Okay, let's say that again. Ripperin equals river. Okay, so on land that is patented into private ownership before July 1st, 1895, I think that was probably a, that's your birthday, I believe, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's what I was making sure, because uh, I knew it was July 1st, 18 July 1st. something, so, yeah. but uh, by the way, you're I think I need to know the, uh, the fountain of you. Where oh, he got she, his she, stuff from. You know my serum? Yeah, she needs my some. She, she needs some. Can you, can you help her? I got, I'll sell anything for a certain price, Miss Leela. Doesn't surprise you think he's that old. You, you do know that I can still beat you up and find out where it is, right? Uh. <laughs> Let's see how fast you are. Uh -oh. <laughs> Don't <laughs> test me now. <laughs> It doesn't surprise me you think he's that old. After all, you didn't think he was born before 1995 the other day. That is true. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even hear what he said. What did he say? Thank you. I said, it doesn't surprise me y'all think he's that old. After all, y'all didn't think he was born before 1995 the other day. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 got the, he got the baby faces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good point. Very good point. <laughs> So, but it's also, it's granted, of course, and the reason I, I said river is it mainly is, it's basically a flow of water, okay? That's what Ripperin deals to. So it's a flow of water that comes through. So it's granted to owners that are along this river or stream, 
There's a right to use water for, of course, domestic purposes, okay? But you cannot interrupt or alter the flow or contaminate the water, okay? There actually have been issues before where that had actually ended up happening, okay? Uh, people would end up, they would get into feuds back in, in that time frame, and they would have an issue. So Travis didn't like Aiden. So the flow of the river would go south. So Travis would get all the water for himself, but then poison the water as it went down to Aiden's house. Okay, uh, you can't do that anymore. Okay, you cannot, or he would, or he just shut off the stream and put rocks up and shut it off and keep it all for himself. And you didn't know nothing. So you couldn't do that either. Okay. Now again, it's, you gotta look at either what's called navigable or non-navigable rivers. Okay, navigable river, rivers are basically considered public highways with public easements or right to travel. So if it is a navigable river, then the state is going to own the water. Okay, so if you can actually get on it and actually basically navigate on, the, on that particular water, the state owns it. It's just like a state highway. Okay, the property owner, of course, owns the land to the mean vegetation line. And then the state will hold title to the remaining land and the mineral rights, okay? In a non-navigable water or river, the state owns the water and the property owner owns land under the water and the mineral rights to the center of the waterway. Because, you know, Travis is gonna go and get, get in the middle of the water and swim down to that land and walk around on it, so, you know, but, um, but again, it is the stream is classification must be determined by or from its official source, and you can't always tell by looking. You gotta be careful, okay? So, and that's where you gotta bring in experts. Sometimes you gotta know your limits, okay? So again, this provides you with riffraff, all right? So if you look at lot A and B on the left, you can kind of see it's, you're not able to put a boat on it, basically, okay? So both parties own the land underneath. Now, not the water, but they own the land underneath. So Travis, if you want to, man, you can walk, you know, just walk under, you can't walk on water on this, I'm sorry. You're going to have to just walk on the ground, okay? Uh, somehow you'll just have to be able to breathe underwater. So if you want to put your porch or whatever outside or put a patio out there, I mean, pretty much you're set there, so. But over here in regards to the right side, you only own up to where the water starts, and then it is owned by the public because it's navigable. Okay, so you got to be able to watch this and don't always just assume it. A lot of people always assume that it's the left. They think, well, I live on Lake Conroe, so I own everything. Not really. Okay, you got to watch how it works. Okay, now literal, you want to put the next one, literal equals lake. Okay, literal equal lake. So literal rights are that they are granted to owners on large navigable right or lakes and oceans. And it's the right to use for domestic purposes. And the property owner owns the land up to the mean vegetation line. Okay, so it's just like this. The mean vegetation line, they, if you live on Lake Conroe, you, let, you have it up to the water but that's it. Then after that, it's all of the, the public, okay? So in that particular situation is you own up to that mark. Now, one thing I wanna say, and I don't think it's in there yet, and it might be, but another thing you need to be careful with on these is if your house, Travis, say this was your house, okay? By the way, I don't know what the heck happened to your house. It looks like it smoked. But uh, <laughs> if that's your house there, what happens when you have land next to water? It could flood, but what's another thing? Could you possibly lose land? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's called what? Erosion. So you could possibly lose. So where that mark is right there could possibly move further left. Okay. But what happens if the water ends up receding? Could you possibly, could that line move to the right? Yes, it can. Okay. Now, appropri uh, appropriation rights is basically is that it's the right to use water that is controlled by the state. That's how we're able to get on Lake Conroe and all those other lakes, okay? We can use it. 
There are permits for use that are issued by the TCEQ, which is upon the evidence of beneficial use of water. You can't get a permit uh, for certain purposes. Now the priority of water is of course going to be determined by the date of the permit that's issued. So if Travis gets his permit first and I get mine second, who gets to go first? Travis. And if Travis uses all of the rights to that water, do I get any? No. So it goes by a first come first serve method. The water permit does not grant access to water source and it must obtain a right away. Again, water right may be canceled if it's not been used for 10 years. Now the groundwater rights is that the water under the earth's surface below the saturation point, okay, would belong, of course, in that situation, the landowner would own that groundwater that is below his particular land. The rule of capture is that the landowner may pump as much water as he or she chooses they may not, however, maliciously take it to injure their neighbor, okay? So Travis can't go over there and purposely try to take all the water and pump all of it so Aiden can't get it, okay? You cannot waste it, okay? You cannot waste it, and it is responsible for the subsidence of the other, of another lands uh, for their particular negligent, result, or, 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 negligent withdrawal. Basically what it is, if you take that much or that water, you don't use it right, you're going to be held uh, criminally liable and civilly liable. Okay. Now this one is where I need to be at, a beach. Okay. It's the open beach law. It says that the public does have the right to use public beaches. The public easement is seaward of the boundary of the natural vegetation. There is to be no structure is permitted to be built within an easement and within the coastal erosion or storms, a structure may be on public land. And that happens sometimes. If you watch Galveston, there's been many times that there's been hurricanes that have came in, done damage, and guess what happened? It's pushed either land in or out. And if it's pulled it out, it's pushed that, basically that easement further in, which means sometimes your house may actually be on public land. And if it is, guess what has to happen? the owner has to be forced to remove that particular structure. Okay. All right. So Mr. Grossman, can you please go ahead and stop our recording for tonight?